Our speaker is the Secretary of Commerce. She's almost a neighbor herself. She was born just across the line in Lancaster County, Pennsylvania. Graduated from uh, Penn State, went through Harvard Business School. She's been on the governor, government and business program of the Wharton School, University of Pennsylvania. She's worked with the, with the United Nations. She's been on the President's advi Advisory Committee on, for Trade Policy. And she was President and Chief Executive Officer of the Franklin Associates, an internationally recognized consulting firm which she founded herself. And to give you her, a flavor of her own philosophy, she says this, quote, in this new era of world peace and global economic prosperity, commerce is America's front line for growth and prosperity. With the greatest of pleasure, I give you the Secretary of Commerce, the Honorable Barbara Franklin, who's going to talk about the new market, opportunities, in the changed world. Thank you very much, Brad, for that, that eloquent introduction. And I'm so delighted to be with you this evening, and Frank and, and uh, all the other members of this wonderful organization. I want to congratulate you on your work. With so much changing in the world over the past few years and the kind of transition we're in into the new world order, I think that groups like yours and your personal involvement and understanding and caring about what's going on are just terribly important. I'm also pleased to be here in Baltimore. It's, it's one of our, I think, one of our most beautiful cities. In some cases, a, a well-kept secret in some other parts of the country. And like many other important American cities, your port is an important part of your economy. And that means, in particular, to Baltimore, that you have a stake in international trade. When new markets open, you stand to gain right here. And today, new markets, new opportunities are literally opening up around the world as we speak. The nations of Latin America now rank among our fastest growing trading partners. Our exports to Mexico alone have tripled since 1987. U.S. exports to the Pacific Rim nations now account for more than one-fourth of our total worldwide exports. And as for Europe, since 1985, when the EC began to lower its trade barriers, the U.S. EC trade balance has moved from a $23 billion deficit to a $17 billion surplus in 1991, and we are running a surplus in 1992, or we did as well. A successful conclusion of the Uruguay round of the General Agreement on Tariffs and Trade, GATT, will build on all of this, and I do believe at some point we will get this agreement because it makes sense. That would add an estimated $5 trillion to the world economy. With that little bit of background tonight, I want to focus more specifically on four markets that I see as particularly important opportunities for American businesses. They are China, Japan, Mexico, and Russia. I do not have to tell you in this room how much the world has changed just in the last few years. There has never been in human history a time like this. Faxes and satellite communications have made the world smaller. CNN links the world with instant reports of events all around the globe. Corporations routinely do business in dozens and dozens of countries. Political and economic freedom are spreading to every corner of the world, knocking down barriers to progress. The stage is being set, I believe, for an explosion of global growth and prosperity and job creation. Peace reigns now, but for the most part around the world anyway, but at a price. 
we were so euphoric about the Cold War's end that none of us fully grasped the economic consequences here in the, in the United States and around the industrialized world, the downsizing of our defense establishments, other structural adjustments, and the restlessness and caution of people everywhere. Combined with the fact that much of the world economy is slow, this time of transition puts some stiff challenges before us. But the United States is meeting these challenges with a competitiveness, a vigor, and a strength that is often underestimated. There's a tremendous reservoir of goodwill and respect for this country, our ideals, our people, and our economic system. Much of the world looks to us for leadership, political and economic. And sometimes I think the rest of the world recognizes our leadership more than we do ourselves. We have the world's largest economy. We are the world's largest exporter. We lead the developed countries in economic growth and in industrial production. We now have the lowest unemployment rate of any of the major industrialized countries except Japan. And we have the most productive workers in the world. A recent study shows that American workers produce an average of $49,600 worth of output every year. We are a leader in technology, in innovation, and in quality. In autos, steel, computers, and other industries, our companies have reduced defects and matched or surpassed their toughest competitors in the last 10 years. We are 5% of the world's people producing 25% of the world's output. The United States is the world's superpower, and we must lead. We must not change this course. And I know there are some who think we should look inward, focus only on problems here at home, become protectionist. These people are dead wrong. We cannot turn our backs on the global marketplace, which means millions of jobs for Americans. Our competitors, from Germany to Japan, are moving quickly into China, Russia, and these other new markets. An American business faced with a raft of tough new competitors needs the support of the American government in dismantling trade barriers and helping to open up these new markets. We must move quickly into these new markets, too. And that is why we say commerce is indeed the new front line. And this is one reason why, some weeks ago, President Bush made the decision to lift the sanction on China against high-level government-to-government meetings. And that, had, that sanction had been imposed after the tragic events of June 1989 at Tiananmen Square. The President, in turn, directed me to lead a mission to China to focus on trade and commercial issues, a central part of which was the reconvening after a four-year hiatus of the Joint Commission on Commerce and Trade, JCCT for short, and I did this together with my Chinese counterpart, Ministry of Foreign Economic uh, this is so hard to say, Ministry of Foreign Economic Relations and Trade, Mofer, Mofert for short, Minister Li Lanching. The JCCT is an important bilateral forum which was established in 1983 to discuss and resolve trade and investment policy issues and help to implement, and, and, uh, implement agreements and solve problems. Recently, in 1992, on October 10th, we signed with China a wide-ranging market access agreement. And earlier in the year, in January, we had signed an agreement on intellectual property rights protection. And that made December an optimal optimal time and frankly the first available time that I could go to Beijing to reconvene the JCCT. And in essence, my trip began the process of translating opportunities made possible by that market access agreement into commercial realities. I think the President's sense of timing was correct. I do not believe we could have afforded to wait. American businesses would have lost precious time, momentum, and market share in China. Let me go over quickly with you the results of the trip which were not insignificant. 
First, we came back with nearly $1 billion worth of new contracts for United States companies. And that includes an $800 million plus deal with China Southern Airlines involving the purchase of six Boeing 777s. And this and other contracts are just part of the short-term benefits of our engagement policy in China. I should, as an aside, tell you that that Boeing contract was in the works, but it was stuck after we sold the F-16s to Taiwan. I met with the aerospace minister here, Minister Lin, before we left and told him that a great message to send back to this country from China would be to have that contract go through we do have a big trade deficit with China, and literally the first thing that occurred after I got there and met with my counterpart, Minister Lee, was that he said, you're going to get your Boeing contract, and we're going to sign it while you're here. Second accomplishment, we moved forward on implementation of the recently negotiated intellectual intellectual property rights and market access agreements. Specifically, the Chinese offered to resol resolve our concerns under their new patent law. We thought it didn't really fulfill the IPR agreement, but they agreed that through their implementing regulations, they would take care of our concerns. They've also assured us that they will be forthcoming with an agreed upon quota liberalization schedule. Now this will help U.S. exporters know with much more certainty which products will or will not be covered by quotas as China opens its market. We also pushed for greater market access in the services area, banking, insurance, accounting, legal. Third, we agreed to neg negotiate a Memorandum of Understanding, MOU in government ease, on end-user checks on dual-use technology products. This is a very important step forward. The Chinese want our export controls on dual-use technology to be liberalized. Dual-use technology could be almost anything, computers that could be diverted from civilian to military use. And we have a control process that, that, uh, that we have to go through in order to ship those kinds of things to a country like China where there is some security concern. We said to them that if you agree to let us check how that, those dual-use technology items are used once they get to China to make sure they're being used for the purpose for which they were sold, then it gives us more leeway here to recommend that we liberalize export controls and therefore we can sell more to you. This, this MOU, which sounds a little esoteric, was really a very important thing to have, to have gotten. Fourth, we agreed to resume negotiations on a bilateral investment treaty. We also pressed the Chinese hard to improve their investment climate. They do things with foreign exchange, balancing, which really is an inhibiting factor to investment. If you have a foreign representative, if a company has an office in China, it can't do anything of a profit-making nature and so on. We've said to the Chinese, you've really got to open up your investment climate if you want more and more companies to come. Fifth, we set up a business development working group under the JCCT. Its purpose is to go through, literally one by one, project, projects that are not moving or projects that we want to get started. And this provides us with a high-level government channel to help move those deals forward, whether it's more airplanes, power equipment, um, McDonald's, or whatever. This new working group will also start trade promotion activities and seminars. And specifically, we will resume our seminar program in China to introduce and explain the legal framework under which our system operates. Our concern, of course, is contracts. Business people need assurances that once contracts are signed, that they're going to be honored. In Hong Kong, we underscored quite publicly the need to honor contracts before and after Hong Kong reverts to Chinese rule in 1997. And what we said in, in effect was if China wants to play in this new world, you've got to send the message that you're going to have a stable business cl climate and honoring contracts is part and parcel of that. This presidential mission to China and Hong Kong was part of a process and a policy that really is a longer-term investment in our economic future. 
The trip also reaffirmed my belief that we must remain engaged in China if we are to contribute to that country's future and if we are to advance this vital trade relationship which has taken us more than a decade to build. China's economy is growing by some estimates at 12% a year. And I would say that in some parts of China, that growth rate is faster. We were in the southern part of China faster than 12% a year. U.S. exports to China, the market is 1.1 billion people. Our exports topped $5 billion last year, but there is much more that we can do. And the trade deficit we are running with China through the first 10 months of 1992 was $15.5 billion. China needs virtually everything we sell, particularly those items that have to do with building of infrastructure. And while my trip focused on commercial issues, we are mindful of the human rights and arms proliferations concerns. And I delivered that message to Premier Li Peng and to other Chinese leaders. I made abundantly clear that reducing the trade deficit, full implementation of the agreements reached this past year, and continued attention to our concerns on human rights and proliferation, all of that was the best way to ensure progress in our bilateral relationship. In encouraging China's economic reforms, we do so in the belief that economic freedom will inevitably lead to personal freedom. History has shown that this is the best way to effect positive change. Whenever you talk about international trade, you cannot ignore, of course, the nation that seems to generate the most debate, Japan. Let me say this, although many challenges remain in our bilateral relationship, I'm very proud of the progress that the Bush administration has made in such areas as glass, paper, large-scale retail stores, and autos and auto parts. One overarching challenge in our relationship is the persistent U.S. trade deficit with Japan. Two-thirds of our current merchandise trade deficit is with Japan. And this still, despite numerous pledges by Japan, to take measures to bring its trade into balance. Furthermore, the current Japanese recession, combined with the impediments that still exist to doing business there, has had a negative impact on our ability, ability to expand exports to the Japanese. And the, their slowdown has in turn caused them to want to export more here. This must change. For our part, we must continue to press for more access of the Japanese market in every possible forum, at every level, in a variety of sectors. Semiconductors, electronics, glass, supercomputers, automobiles, auto parts, services, and government procurement, to name a few. The U.S. share of the Japanese semiconductor market, in particular, remains a preeminent concern particularly since foreign market share, and they, we are operating under an agreement there from the Japanese side, foreign market share decreased in the third quarter, and that was very disappointing to us. There must also be consistency in our actions toward Japan. As with our policy toward China, it is my sincerest hope that the incoming administration will see the merits of our approach to Japan. It's also my sincerest hope that the incoming administration builds on our efforts to date to foster a creative new partnership between business and government to meet the challenges of the Japanese marketplace. One such effort recently was a joint Department of Commerce efforts symposium with the U.S.-Japan Business Council, that's a private sector group, on the Japanese market. We called on the U.S business communi community to embrace an export vision for the Japanese marketplace, and then for Japan to match this effort with an import vision of her own. The incoming administration must also insist in no uncertain terms, as we have done, that Japan keep to its commitments. And this includes commitments made in the Tokyo Declaration, which followed, or rather were signed when President Bush visited Asia and Japan uh, about a year ago. Progress is imperative. Empty promises and mere gestures, such as the announcement last week by Japan of a voluntary export restraint in the area of automobiles, 
These are insufficient. Japan cannot continue to flout the rules of multilateral trade if Japan wants to be recognized as a world leader commensurate with her economic strength, then she needs to send a strong signal to the world by truly opening her markets and living up to her commitments. And let's be clear, whenever Japan fails to meet the spirit and letter of the law in her commitments, we in America can and should use our trade laws to, comp to compel free and fair trade. I'm sure that many of you are familiar with at, at least some of our work on the third major market I want to discuss, and that's Mexico. Building on the free trade agreement we signed with Canada, President Bush has pursued a policy with Mexico that is designed to pull down the barriers to trade in all of North America. The North American Free Trade Agreement, the NAFTA, is based on a realization that together, Canada, Mexico, and the United States can create more jobs, and more economic growth in each nation. This agreement, I believe, will go down in history as one of President Bush's finest accomplishments. And my hat is off to all of our negotiators, especially the team of some 50 Commerce Department professionals who helped make real the possibility of the world's largest and richest free trade area. 360 million consumers, an annual output of $6 trillion. I am very concerned, however, about the fear that surfaces in some parts of our country just at the mention of NAFTA. Many fear we will export jobs instead of products. I think this is an exaggerated fear. Reducing tariffs, which is what will come with the agreement, and other trade barriers will make it easier and cheaper for American producers to sell in Mexico. Therefore, there will be less incentive to move to Mexico to do business there. One study, the one I like best, anyway, out of the numerous studies I've seen about job creation and job loss w with respect to the NAFTA, that study would indicate a net gain of at least 175,000 jobs, U.S. jobs, as a result of the NAFTA, many of them in manufacturing. My view of it is that the, benefit, the benefits of NAFTA will be even greater than we expect in terms of job creation here at home, simply because I think we're going to have more trade than we expect with Mexico and with Canada. Mexico is now our third largest recipient of American exports behind Canada and Japan, and I consider it a very vital, dynamic, and growing market for us in the future. Last year, our trade with Mexico topped $40 billion, and unlike Japan, we ran a trade surplus with Mexico of more than $5 billion, including a healthy surplus in manufactured goods and advanced technology products. American companies can build on this once the NAFTA further opens Mexico's economy to more free market reforms, privatization, and free trade. So we need the NAFTA. It is my hope that the incoming administration will move forward vigorously to push for the ratification of this new agreement and that the new Congress, and there are 123 new members of that Congress, will act to ratify it quickly and appropriately. And once the NAFTA has been, been ratified, then, then the President's vision of a hemispheric free trade agreement, his Enterprise for the Americas initiative, is possible. And this will open in Latin America as those countries become part of this area. This will open more and more markets for American exports, and that means more opportunities for American business and for American workers. Now, last but certainly not least, let me talk about the former Soviet Union, particularly the emerging Russian market. Right now, the greatest threat face, facing Russia's reforms is its economic plight. This is one of the reasons that at the Department of Commerce, I have pressed for new initiatives that will help stimulate American investment and increased trade with Russia. This investment in trade can help Russia as President Yeltsin, pursue, President Yeltsin continues to pursue economic reform and stabilize the new democracy.
In June of last year, I was proud to host President Bush and President Yeltsin in Washington at the first ever U.S.-Russia Business Summit. At last, a summit occurred between Americans and Russians which focused on trade rather than armaments. Nearly 100 Russian and 200 American business people came, all anxious to develop trade and business opportunities. At that summit, with a little pressure from us, some contracts were signed, many other contacts were made, and many more business deals are in the works. Also, my Russian counterpart, then Minister of Foreign Economic Relations, Peter Avin, and I established a U.S.-Russia Business Development Committee. And through this vehicle, similar to the JCCT with the Chinese, we're following up and pushing ahead some 50 potential American projects. We're working with our Russian friends to clear away obstacles, and there are many, to investment. We are also helping them to create a banking system which they really don't have in any form that resembles ours, a legal system. Same thing can be said. And we're working to remove the bureaucratic barriers that they have, and there are many. And we're joining forces to move forward in the area of helping them convert some of their big defense plants to be able to do something else with them, defense conversion. However, in the recent cabinet changes in Russia, Minister Avin has been replaced by Minister Glasyev, who is all of 31 years old. Trade remains in that ministry, but the investment part of the portfolio has been taken over by Deputy Prime Minister Shokin. Thus, our Business De Development Committee now has two agencies to work with, and we are currently sorting out how best to approach this new relationship. I might add that this musical chairs has been more the norm than not in dealing with the Russian government recently. Whatever happens, our government needs to persevere, as, as do our businesses, to gain a foothold in this new free market economy. We need to keep the momentum going there, and that, in turn, will help stabilize this fragile democracy. Russia. Japan, Mexico, and China, like much of the world, including the U.S., are in a period of transition. Our challenge, and particularly that of the incoming administration, is to take advantage of this time. I really believe the world has changed. And in this post-Cold War era, commerce is the new front line for promoting jobs and creating economic growth and prosperity. With new markets emerging everywhere, a window of opportunity for unprecedented economic growth is also opening. And we as a nation must take advantage of this opportunity and really commit ourselves to going for it in the global marketplace. In traveling this country, a lot of it during the campaign in the fall, a Secretary of Commerce, I learned that there are a lot of places where you mention trade, free trade, NAFTA, whatever, and people are fearful. There is not yet a consensus in our country that more trade means more U.S. jobs and more economic growth. In fact, every $1 billion worth of U.S. exports supports or creates some 19,000 good jobs here at home. We must work, I believe, to create this national consensus. We must recognize that we are part of a global marketplace and really get serious about going after business around the world, from Mexico City to Moscow. You can be very sure that our toughest competitors are doing just that. And I believe we can compete with anyone anywhere in the world when we have open markets and a level playing field. A quality revolution has taken hold here in the last decade. We continue to lead in innovation and technology, and our working men and women are the most productive in the world. With assets like these and the will to do it, we can compete in the global marketplace, not just in China, Mexico, Russia, and Japan, but everywhere in the world. And we can win. And that, to me, is our challenge today. Thank you very much. We, uh, we thank you for a uh, thoroughly informative and vigorous uh, uh, presentation. Uh, the floor is now open for questions. 
until 10 minutes after 7. Yes, sir, at the microphone. Thank you. We've heard a lot made about um, technological advances and the need for workers to um, be sufficient, um, much more sophisticated in the next decade or so. I think we've also heard some about our American education system and the measuring comparative studies to some European and oriental systems and our students don't seem to match up quite as well in a number of parameters and in fact in some instances some of them are barely able to read when they leave high school. Do you see that as a real problem in terms of the training of students to be workers in a competitive world and if so what do you suggest we do about it? You've got several things there. One is education and whether we need, in effect, whether we need to do something to reform our education system. I think clearly the answer is yes. And uh, this president certainly had some proposals on the table that were very interesting ones. I, from all I have been hearing, it sounds to me as though the new administration will pick up on some of these same things, but there's no question that we really do have to get, get with it in educational terms. In terms of the other thing you pointed out, the, the worker, worker retraining. Uh, I think we need to do more there too. And again, uh, President Bush had had uh, almost ten billion dollars worth of of uh, different kinds of proposals on the table to to try to help retrain workers who were displaced for one reason or another, defense conversion or something. And uh, I, I think this is a whole other area. It is not my area of, of expertise. I have a competitiveness agenda. I've been following at Commerce. It's the way I've been running the department that has seven, seven things in it. It could just as well have had in it education and upgrading of skills and worker retra retraining. It just happens that those things are not my portfolio. <laughs> so that's why they're not, they're not uh, in, in my list of seven. But I think you're on to two very important things that are part of our competitiveness package. I should probably tell you what's in my competitiveness package. Exports, free and fair trade, innovation and technology. I believe we must continue to lead the world in technology if we're going to lead economically. Quality. Entrepreneurship, meaning small business, two-thirds of our new jobs come from small business development or creation and growth. Right now, small business formations are off. It is a concern. It's why our economy is not creating jobs. Our economy's turned around. We're not creating jobs fast enough. It's because small business is off. Deregulation, uh, product liability reform, I would throw into that one, and sustainable development. But that list could also include education and upgrading of worker skills. Thank you. Yes, sir, at the far microphone. Uh, yes. You had, regarding the uh, NAFTA agreement, uh, you mentioned that your research showed uh, approximately 175,000 uh, net gain in jobs. Yes. Um, did it tell you or could you tell us um, what is the, uh, um, the income levels on these jobs, what, what uh, industries are going to be affected, and w what are the demographics of, of that? Um, I can give you some general answers. That study done by the, that's the one done by the Institute of International Economics, was, uh, was pro project projecting that we would, at the bottom of the pay scale after the NAFTA, lose 150,000 jobs. However, we would create 325,000 jobs, and that's where you get the net gain of 175,000. They, te they tend to be higher paying jobs. They're manufacturing jobs. That's about as generic as I can be. I don't know exactly in, in what. I would have to go back and look at the assumptions. But in other words, they're, they're not low-paying jobs. They're higher-paying jobs. That, that's the whole point. They're good jobs. And I truly believe that that's what's going to happen. We send manufactured goods to Mexico. That's what we are sending. And with that market growing the way it's growing and its demand there, both for all kinds of infrastructure, this huge market for environmental uh, protection, everything, and also consumer products. I, I just think we're going to keep shipping more and more to um, to Mexico, creating more jobs, good jobs back here. Yes, sir. Uh, Madam Secretary, you, one of the industries that you <coughs> neglected to address tonight, but which I'm sure you haven't neglected to address at Commerce, is agriculture. And specifically, I wanted to ask you about, uh, in terms of our relationship with Japan, and the fact that the California rice growers have such a, an abundance 
uh, and yet have been squeezed out of that market so consistently. And then just in general, uh, in terms of the, uh, the subsidized farmers in France and the impact that they had on the progress of the Maastricht Treaty, would you just comment on that in general? <laughs> That's a big question. <laughs> uh, agriculture is a big area. The reason I don't talk about it is that, once again, it's going to sound bureaucratic. It's not my portfolio. <laughs> There's an agriculture secretary who talks about it a lot. However, we do a lot of trade in, uh, in agriculture. And agriculture right now is, is probably, has been the last few years, the stickiest wicket in, in for example, concluding the uh, Uruguay round because we're going through the, the whole drill with the, with the Europeans and the way they subsidize, and they are starting to re revamp a bit their, their whole agricultural scheme, but it comes hard there because it's a way of life. Japan is the same way. When you look, you've I'm sure been to Japan and seen, the, seen these, these tiny plots. It, it's, it's people are, are wedded to these tiny plots. It's a very expensive way to, to do anything. So Japan has been a holdout also on the agricultural side. I just think in time that, that these, the political stranglehold that the agricultural people have had in some of these countries will just have to lessen because it only makes sense, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna come easy. And of course the U.S. has taken a very strong position on this because we really want agriculture and trade in agriculture to come under the aegis of the GATT. And if we can get that through the Uruguay round, that, then it's good. we're gonna have a whole new world in terms of agricultural trade, and that will really benefit our people. So we keep, uh, we keep hammering away on the Uruguay round. And as I said, at some point, we're gonna get it because it makes sense for the world economy, and I think most people know that. But I think now we're gonna to have to wait till after the French elections. Thank you. <laughs> for sure, in March. Yes, ma'am. <clears throat> Hello, my name is Kate Woody, and I'm author of the book Soviet Banking and Finance. I, re re as you said, there's no, no banking, but there is a little bit more than most people think. I returned within the last two months from a trip working on a project with the St. Petersburg Stock Exchange on bank payments and clearings. In this trip, I visited St. Petersburg, Tallinn, Estonia, Riga, Latvia, Vilnius, Lithuania, and Moscow, and worked with the Birges, which are the trading stock exchanges and trading houses that are developing, as well as the private and central banks that are developing in Russia. Uh, in talking with these new trading houses, which are the mechanism for supplementing and substituting the old state planning system with the new supply and demand system, uh, I talked with all of them and received one question. Why aren't the Americans in Russia? Why aren't the Americans in the Baltic states? Uh, there is an emphasis on small business, particularly for the needs of this country, and I would like some of your recommendations to the next administration on how they can buttress and support, particularly with respect to receiving credits, uh, even beyond OPIC and uh, XM Bank, for supporting this kind of trade in Russia. The Russians very much identify with Americans, and yeah. they would very much, by their own exclamations, prefer to deal with Americans than people in other parts of the country, world, particularly I, even Europe or Japan. I have heard the same thing. They, they really want, they want us to be there, and uh, President Yeltsin sort of said the same thing, shaking his fist like he does, where are you? Yeah. <laughs> when he's, when he's here in June. Um, there have been, I mean, our trade, if you now look at what's happened just this year, it is going up. And there are, I mean, I, somebody comes to my office every week with some new plan to do something or other to invest in Russia. And they typically want us to, to watch over it if we can. The bureaucratic obstacles have been just horrendous. It just horrendous, and now, of course, as I've just told you, they've, they've shaken the, the, the tree again so that our business development committee, which really was starting to work, it has nine, um, nine different subgroups, and we've, we've moved ahead in defense conversion. We've moved ahead on a number of them, but now they've, they've changed the players on the other side, which is a very frustrating kind of thing. That's what happens to, to our business people, too. And then, in some cases, there are very specific contracts we've been working on. The Marriott Hotel people thought they had a deal last 
uh, last May. Uh, it, it still is not consummated. And the President of the United States himself brought that one up with, with Yeltsin. I mean, it, it, it is just not, not easy. Nonetheless, I think we just have to keep, keep uh, pushing away in, in every conceivable, conceivable fashion um, that, w that we have. And probably what we need now are some new ideas to hand to the administration. I have had my counterpart, my, my, not my counterpart, my successor, Ron Brown, it was in and talked with me for about an hour uh, two weeks ago. And this, Russia was one of the areas that I spotlighted for him, saying, and I know the Russians are worried about losing momentum. And uh, the new administration is going to have to to, uh, to really push on all this. My friend Bob Galvin, who is the, the um, retired now CEO of Motorola, has an idea that had we stayed in office, I think the president would have gone forward with. And that was, his idea was simply implanting capitalism and, and uh, rounding up, whatever, a thousand companies to, to make an investment of a million dollars each in Russia. Something like that, now it's probably easier said than done, but something like that I really believe needs to be done from uh, from from here. The other side of this is that we don't do some things. Um, we don't subsidize and we don't have our government tangled up financially in, in the same way that some of the Europeans do, which frankly puts us at a disadvantage, which is why yeah. I do believe that, that our business and government establ establishments really need to be working very closely together. We're never going to subsidize the way the Europeans do, I hope. I think it's <laughs> trade distorting. We'd like to get them to stop doing it. But in, in, the, in the interim, it just makes it, it harder. But I, so I don't know. It's a, sort of a general answer. I think we really need to keep pushing on, on Russia, though, uh, be, because if, if we can't get that free market to take off, then I'm not sure what happens. I'm not sure what happens politically. And that's, uh, that could be destabilizing once Thank again you. for the world. Thank you very much. Yes, sir. Um, trying to pick a, since there's a number of areas here, pick a question of interest, at least to me, uh, in regards to uh, NAFTA and Mexico, uh, I'd like to sort of throw out a scenario and uh, ask if you could tell me how NAFTA water would not deal with this situation. We have in Baltimore a, a very large integrated steel mill of the Bethlehem Steel Company. It makes, uh, among other things, sheet metal. It's used in automobiles, appliances. And uh, I believe there are factories, some American factories in Mexico already now that make automobiles and appliances. Mm -hmm. The steel industry has been uh, offered or given or demanded a lot of protection uh, over the recent years, at least the last decade or so. And frankly, they've needed it, uh, particularly Bethlehem Steel, and such things as, as import quotas, uh, anti-dumping actions, and so forth. But it occurs to me that um, or the possibility it occurs to me that, uh, say, a factory in Mexico could import uh, sheet steel from uh, Taiwan, Brazil, uh, China, whatever, uh, say it's substantially less than what American uh, product would cost, incorporate it into a manufactured product, automobiles, washing machines, whatever, uh, and then export it to the United States at reduced or eventually zero tariffs. Uh, and that that might have a considerably serious impact on the American steel industry, or at least Bethlehem Steel. Um, how would you say, do, does NAFTA address that? I, I guess that's what they would call the content type law. Uh, is that prevented or preventable under NAFTA? Um, I'm not sure. I mean, I'm, I'm honestly not sure of the answer to that question. Um, if we just talk steel for a minute, uh, one of the concerns since the VRA, the voluntary restraints, ran out last March, uh, one of the concerns of our steel industry is that there's a lot of dumped steel at too low prices in, in our market. Um, well, suppose they dump it in Mexico. Yeah, I, I, I don't know wh whether our laws, uh, that's an interesting legal question. So, well, it's a rule of origin, except that I'm not sure how it applies. To somebody, is there an expert here on the rules of origin? That's, that's the, the, the bottom line of this, whether they dump it in Mexico. Right now, there are probably 60 anti-dumping cases uh, of, of such 
allegedly dumped steel. The preliminary determination of, uh, the, which is the first step down the quasi-judicial route, those are coming out January 26th. That was one of the things I alerted my successor to because I think the margins could conceivably be quite large and people from all over the world will be screaming. If you're really serious in pursuing that, I can get you a, I, I need to have my lawyers probably look at the agreement and, and see if we can answer your question. I honestly don't know. <laughs> yes, sir. Give a card to somebody down here if you would like. We're only in office for another week or so, but in that time, <laughs> we'll get you the answer if we can. <laughs> at, at the far microphone. Madam Secretary, you uh, mentioned four what you consider to be four major markets, uh, four major prospective markets. Um, what are your thoughts on Southeastern uh, Asia and uh, Africa? Oh, e all of Asia is, is a is a booming marketplace. It was a question of not being able to put everything in this speech. But the highest uh, growth rates, economic growth rates by countries right now are in, are in Asia. And I think uh, for us to look the other way, we do so at our peril. We're underrepresented in Asia right now. And I think uh, uh, in any of those countries, uh, the ambassadors who are really thinking and looking around would, would say that. In fact, I had a group of them come to see me last summer from uh, all of a whole bunch of those countries, Korea, uh, Singapore, um, Indonesia, Malaysia, uh, Thailand, saying, you know, where is American business? And so we have been trying to put the word out. I think there are great opportunities there. My own view of it is in the 80s when we got too carried away here with, uh, oh, I don't know, with takeovers and with what I considered to be rather unproductive moving of money around rather than creating anything. I think some companies pulled back from uh, with respect to their plans in that part of the world just because I think it was farther away. I think we need to really go for it again. Africa is a whole other matter. Uh, and there are s clearly some places in Africa where there are uh, there are good markets, and I think we not we need to start thinking about Africa. Africa as a as a continent. This is going to be a too generic comment, but forgive me for a minute. But Africa. If it doesn't keep up, and it really isn't now with the rest of the world economically, it's going to end up being a drag on the rest of the world. And so it's really in our collective interest to bring free markets and more capitalism and more prosperity to Africa. That's a very much harder, longer-term issue, though. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Hi, I'd like to ask, what role do you think women will play in international trade, especially dealing with four male-dominated societies? <laughs> I, uh, I guess I think whatever, whatever role, uh, whatever role they want to play. I, I, I think American women end up being kind of an exception to whatever the rules are. I think the rest of the world now has gotten used to American women sort of being everywhere and doing everything. And some chief executive asked me a question like this after I took this job. How was I going to deal with all of these men who were my counterparts around the world? And uh, my answer to that is going to be just, <laughs> it was going to be just fine. That uh, part of it is because I'm representing the United States of America. And I think we could send a green monkey into these places, and whoever it would, they would deal with it because it's from the United States. Sometimes I don't think we understand that. And so an American woman, you know, big deal. Actually, I think it can be an advantage. In some ways, I felt that it was in China an advantage. The, uh, my counterpart said to me at one point that I was both a good cop and a bad cop all at once because I was delivering heavy messages, but I was so friendly. <laughs> in some ways, I think women can do that kind of thing better. And I, so I guess I don't, I don't see any problem with women doing anything. I told that CEO who made that comment to me that sometimes I thought I might have more trouble back here at home. <laughs> <laughs> and the attitudes of some of the men that I was going to around the world. I just think we can't let that kind of thing bother us. Thank you. That's where I am. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. This is a delightful follow-up question to that. I was going to say, in what ways do you think your successor style will differ from yours? But now that I've met you, I take that back. Ron Brown isn't nearly as glamorous. <laughs> Thank uh, you. However, 
uh, going into his style perhaps in administrating uh, and his policy style, in what ways do you anticipate the new department uh, differing very much from your own? Um, hard to tell. I, I spent, as I said, I spent an hour, good solid hour with him. We're going to do it again because we really didn't finish. What I told him was, was my my perspective on managing this department. This department's got a budget of three billion dollars, thirty six thousand five hundred people in it, and fourteen different pieces, agencies or, or bureaus. And I think the only way you can manage something like this is to, to set some objectives, which is why I set a, a, the, my seven-point agenda, and then begin to drive all of the resources and the energies of the different parts of the department around those objectives. You have to get it into the budget process and into management by objectives, and there are a few other things you have to do in order to make it work. And it's a bit of a culture change, but it can work. It was working. I'm just sorry I haven't had a little more time to, to really bring it to fruition. So I shared that with him and told him that I know it was working and that I hope he would continue it. Um, I think... Uh, Did he seem responsive? Well, he, he was, he was non-committal. Well, I mean, what could, what could you expect? I mean, he, he listened very intently. So we will see what, how, how, he, uh, how he does and, and what he wants to emphasize. Some of this, of course, I mean, you don't set the agenda just out of the air, or one doesn't. I set the agenda based on what I, I really thought was right, but it was also based on what the president wanted me to do. And so Ron Brown has, has got to be responsive to what the president-elect wants Thank him you. to do. But I'm hoping he continues the, uh, our agenda, because I think it's right. Thank you. Yes, sir. Uh, of the four countries you mentioned, uh, they both and they kind of divide in half in terms of their economic development. It appears in non-defense related industries and their level of manufacturing complexity. And I guess my, my question revolves around how do your strategies vary, for instance, in dealing with, say, Russia and China in terms of helping them stimulate their manufacturing, be it manufacturing or economic development in general, given that it's a little less developed, per se, than a Japan or, um, or an, any other westernized country. And for example, uh, in basic manufacturing, a lot of the complex manufacturers in this country rely heavily on smaller manufacturers to, um, to roll products into their assembly processes, et cetera. And, would you, for instance, collectivize small manufacturers here to try and stimulate a lesser complex, a non-complex uh, manufacturing environment, say, in Russia, versus in dealing with Japan? I guess you want to uh, try and get the more, the larger manufacturer with the more complex products to try and invest and gain market share. Um. Goodness. <laughs> what a question. I, I'm, I'm interested in the difference in the two strategies you may have for the different countries. Um, I guess I don't approach it like that because I don't think I can second guess American business people about how they want to go about doing things. And I think when government gets into the business of trying to tell business how to do something, then I think, then I think we're in trouble. That's why I don't like the whole industrial policy approach to technology of government. Somebody in government like me or a bunch of other people sitting back and deciding we will we will advance this technology and we will not advance this one. Government will mess it up. So I, I'm a great believer in our business people and in our system. I think we've got the best economic system and the most entrepreneurial and creative one in the world. So if, if I, I feel that my role in, in government would be to spotlight a, a new market that has possibilities and then let American business decide how to capitalize on them. Do you find that maybe in some of the countries, such as Russia, Russia and, and China, where it's less complex manufacturing opportunities, for instance, that maybe more be a, that might be more appropriate for smaller firms? Do you find that there's a a, um, a need for greater involvement by the Commerce Department, perhaps, or um, greater greater um, it, investigation? Well, I'll tell you, in, just in general, we would like to see more middle-sized and small companies getting into this, this, uh, this new arena. Only one out of every three companies here that could be exporting is now doing so. And so I don't know that size matters as much. The big companies are more likely to understand what's going on. The smaller ones, um, and we can help them with trade data and, and some of that kind of thing. I think, for example, Russia needs both. Russia needs some, some, big, some big projects in its energy sector 
sector in its agriculture, agribusiness sector, but it also needs all these little pockets of capitalism because Russia doesn't have that. The Chinese, the, the Chinese know how to do capitalism. <laughs> they really do. So I, I, I just think, uh, again, I guess I would just in, encourage more and more involvement and, and let the marketplace sort out how that gets done. I'm sorry, but this will have to be our last okay. question. We try to end our sessions promptly at 7.10. Sir, you have the last question. I'm interested based on the anti-dumping margins <laughs> imposed on Japan with the power tool, with the Black & Decker uh, recent, recent uh, margins, what repercussions do you see coming from Japan and other countries that we impose these margins on? Well, our, our anti-dumping countervailing duty laws, which are enforced by the Commerce Department, are really the only tools we have or our industries have if they really feel that there is something unfair going on. And so they have a right under those laws to petition the government. There's a quasi-judicial process, then a whole bunch of things, other things have to happen. And there's a separate finding once the Commerce Department makes a finding. It has to go to the International Trade Commission to, to decide whether, in fact, the in, in, there is injury, has been injury to the, to the industry that has petitioned. If all those steps are gone through, I've now made this a whole lot simpler than it is, but, and there is a finding of injury, and, and then duties are imposed, I mean, that's, uh, that's our quasi-judicial legal process. And some countries do scream and yell about it, but there is a process. We're not just doing this because we decided to do it. It's not arbitrary. I mean, it's, it's, it's for, for good cause. And I mean, I, we hear some screaming and yelling, but I mean, I, I think on the other hand, there are countries who know that, that uh, we have this right and that what we're doing is, is, um, is just and appropriate. Sometimes they threaten to do things back to us. Quite often they threaten and don't do anything. I mean, but I think we need our trade laws because other we have the most open market in the world here. And some of these other countries, that even those who scream, don't have markets that are as open as ours. I don't think J Japan can scream one bit at us because there still are sectors of that market that simply are not open. And that's what we're really trying to get at, the whole world linked in, in uh, the most open market system without trade distor distortions of one kind or another that we can get. Mr. Jacobs. <clears throat> Madam Secretary, there is one question that I don't think you answered altogether clearly. That green monkey you were sending out, was that a, gr a girl <laughs> monkey or a boy monkey? <laughs> I think you Take gave tonight <laughs> what has to have been the most eloquent and convincing description of free trade that I've heard from a long time. And I wish Bill Clinton were here to hear. hear. Maybe he a Bill? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you for having me.